Hey everybody, <clears throat> I'm making this video to address the question of whether Christian singles should pray together and should read the Bible together while they're dating. Um, and is there any danger in that? Uh, so, there's an article on boundless.org, and I'll put a link down in the description. And there's some statements in this article. The article is written about this question, and it's raising cautions to whether Christians should, Christian singles should pray together uh, while they're dating. So there's a few different comments made in this article. Uh, one of the things that this uh, author says is that after praying together alone, many couples will feel a deeper connection to each other. Early on in a relationship, this could make a couple feel like they have a deeper connection than they really do. And <clears throat> I think that's legit. And from my perspective, the reason I think that there's danger there is that from what I've put together, and, and this is the reason why... Uh, I've seen in charismatic circles when they encourage people to start to step out in the gift of prophecy, why they have the rule, no dates, no mates, no babies, um, uh, no mates. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons for that, I believe, is that the same cognitive faculties and the same systems in our body that are activated when we as believers worship God and we have an experience with God, uh, those same faculties come into play in how we experience someone else romantically. I think there's a lot of overlap. And I think that if a believer is used to having a certain experience with God in prayer, if they're used to having a certain experience with uh, God in worship and in being led by the Holy Spirit, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple is where you experience God. And you experience God in your body. Uh, the thing is that those same faculties can also be brought into play when experiencing someone that you're romantically attracted to. And so I think a lot of us uh, make the mistake and say, Oh, well, I feel this way about this person, so this has got to be God, this, this has got to be the leading of the Spirit, and it's not. Um, the Old Testament is full of examples of how um, people who are in covenant with God, particularly men who are in covenant with God, uh, can fall, can go astray, can be led from worshiping God with fidelity to God to full-on idolatry and spiritual error because of being with, with the wrong woman, because of developing uh, affections for a woman who's not a believer. So, all that to say, look, you got to be careful. There, there is there's a, a legitimate caution there. Understand that no matter how you feel about it and what experience you're having, until you are at that altar and have done the work necessary to be there and say, I do, that it's not that. It's, you know, um, I would be careful about telling stories about things that are meant to be and about destiny. And I think that some people's theology emphasizes predestination in such a way that they're looking for it. And, oh, this is, this is meant to be all the things are lining up and this is God's plan look you know leave room for the sovereignty of God leave room that you see through a glass darkly you know um, however it looks to you as a believer uh, it's not impossible for anybody to miss it missing it is a really easy thing to do so you always have to leave space for the fact that you're missing it um, I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think that their principled stand for their faith when they were thrown into the fiery furnace is an example of the fact that they were doing the right thing. They were on God's side. And I think that they had some inclination that, that God would save them. They said, 
Look, Nebuchadnezzar, just so you know, God is 100% able to save us from your fiery furnace. That's not even a problem for him. But even if he doesn't, he's still God. And so I think that if a relationship looks like this is God, God's totally in this, this is the person that I've been praying for, and there's all of this stuff, uh, that's great, you know, follow it out. But leave that room like they did. I think this is your person for me, God. But even if she's not, even if he's not, you're still God, you're still sovereign, and you may choose to bring an end to this, and you may have had other purposes in this. That's what the entire book of Job is about. Sometimes we don't understand uh, what's going on, or, or why this happened, or why this is happening. Uh, so there's wisdom there. You know, feeling a deep connection to someone is not a guarantee that this is the person that God has for you and that God has brought into your life. Um, I also think that in cultures where um, uh, parents uh, choose the match for their children, I think this is a way to overcome that. Uh, you know, right now I feel all of these things for this person and, and I have all of this stuff going on, um, but your father and mother will have a better idea about how you're going to feel about it in 20 years when, when all of the hormones and the brain drugs that come along with feeling romantic feelings are gone. I think they're going to have a better idea about what that's going to look like. And, you know, I think that that um, has sorted itself well, uh, sorted itself out well in the past uh, in a lot of ways, uh, in terms of, um, you know, when, when a man and, you know, when a man goes to his, his dad and says, hey, dad, uh, I've been... I've been making eyeballs at this woman and I've been talking with her and I'd like you to go and get her to be my wife. Uh, and then, uh, you know, getting dad on board, getting mom on board with that. I think that's, I think that's a really fantastic safeguard. Um, though it seems to be more or less completely absent in our culture. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that we as a culture should go back to that. But I'm saying that we should think about it. Uh, okay, another thing that this article says. Uh, is your prayer life the same in public and private? Hopefully so. For many Christians, it can be a struggle to keep a regular private prayer time. This is a hard truth. Amen. This is a hard truth, but God is more interested in our real, authentic relationship with him and how well we've learned to keep up than how well we've learned to keep up appearances. And at the risk of sounding like Judgy McJudgerson, let me warn that some people use the trappings of spiritual depth to win a person's heart. Beware of people who seem to be proud or boastful about their own spiritual life. They may be showing you what they think you want to see. I couldn't agree more. Amen to all of that. That is fantastic. People deceive. Spiritual abuse is a thing. Um, and uh, it takes time. It takes time watching people, watching how they walk out their relationship with God. Everybody's got struggles, uh, but uh, spiritual manipulation is a thing. And um, so just be aware of that. In your private prayer life, in my opinion, in your private time in the Word of God, is your best defense against that. If you have a heart after God and you're lifting someone up regularly in prayer before Him with their, with love, agape love for them with their best and highest good in mind, then I think that these things sort themselves out. And, uh, and I think that if you're, if you're dating someone and you're praying for them regularly, uh, if you're praying, God, I want this woman or I want this man to have the best husband or to have the best wife that they possibly can. And uh, and that you hope that that person is you, man, I think you're on the right track. I think that's the right way to do it. Um, another quote was, a person's private prayer life is much more important than their public prayer life. Again, I couldn't agree with that statement more. Um, you need to have a private prayer life. 
And if you don't have regular, consistent, private devotions, private times hearing from God through the Word of God, private times, you know, lifting uh, things up to God in heartfelt prayer, in believing prayer, in Bible-based prayer, if you don't have private times of just worshiping God, then you need to sort that out before you're even thinking about dating. Because the idea that you're going to bring this mess into a relationship and then sort it out there, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't like that at all. Uh, look, the thing to remember is that God is not just your father. God is that other believer's father. I had a, a wise man in the faith um, um, tell me one time, a long time ago, uh, I'm divorced now, and, uh, and when I was married... Uh, and things were tough in the marriage, uh, he told me, I want you to stop thinking of God as your father for a little while, just as an exercise. I want you to think of God as your father-in-law. And I want you to think of that woman that you're married to as uh, God's daughter. And, and that however you treat her is how you're treating God's daughter. That's his girl. God's your father-in-law. I think Christian singles would do well to start thinking like that right now. That person that you want, that person you're praying and believing for, that's God's son or that's God's daughter. Uh, God is your father-in-law. Let's sit with that. Sit with that. Chew on that for a while. That's a good one. Okay. So, so here's my thoughts about um, Christians, uh, you know, I gave some thoughts on, on this article. Uh, it's a good article. It brings up some important stuff. And so here's, here's some other thoughts that I have um, about this subject. So, yeah. Um, to the pure, all things are pure. Uh, okay, Titus 1.15. Heavenly Father, I pray that you give me and I pray that you give everyone watching this video the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this, the knowledge of you. You said whoever, whoever asks for wisdom, that you give them liberally and that you don't hold their sins against them when you do. We believe that we receive this from you according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupt and do not believe, nothing is pure. Uh, so, so, if you are playing games in your heart with how you relate to the person that you're dating, uh, it can't be fixed. You can't fix it. In that instance, can... Can prayer go wrong? Uh, yeah, yeah, because your heart's not in the right place. You know, and then I imagine that the next thing that would happen would be prayer is becoming now an excuse to get together and create a context wherein you'll sin, wherein you'll be able to seduce this other person or to put yourself in a compromised situation to see if somebody else has compromise in their heart too. In that situation, even prayer can be a defiling thing. And also, in that situation, your prayer isn't really about God. You know, uh, the when Jesus criticizes the Pharisee, when there's the Pharisee and the tax collector praying in the temple. He says this thing, that the Pharisee is praying to himself. And uh, I don't know if that's hermeneutically correct, that to say that, well, this guy was praying to himself. Uh, but there's a good principle there, even if the exegesis is wrong. And it's that your prayer is supposed to be about God. Your prayer isn't about you. Your prayer isn't about other people. It's not about praying. Um, it, it, it's not about praying words that you want other people to hear. You know, uh, sometimes people pray these backdoor things where, uh, 
you know, I've been in prayer meetings and somebody has something that they disagree with somebody else about and they will put it in the prayer to sort of say something to this person that's also in the prayer meeting, also in the room, uh, because they want to, to make a, a statement about something that that person said that they believe or something about that person's theology or something like that. Don't do that. Prayer is about connection with God. And so, I, you, that's the focus of prayer. There's just nothing for it. Uh, let's talk about the Rechabites. So, the Rechabites bring us a special piece of wisdom from Jeremiah 35. And one of the things about the Rechabites is that uh, the Rechabites didn't drink alcohol. Uh, they were a family group, and their ancestor had taught them not to drink alcohol. And I think there's something legit there, because some people can't drink alcohol. It was perfectly fine with God for people to drink alcohol in moderation in ancient Israel, and it still is, and God's totally fine with that. You know, the Bible it says, hey, don't get drunk. Don't get in drunk to sin. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. But for the Rechabites, uh, what I see is some people who can't drink. Uh, these are just those people, you know, alcohol's not for everybody, and this is a family line, and I think that somebody who uh, probably is an addictions counselor or who knows more about uh, the genetics uh, behind addictions could probably bring some really great insight to, to, to this whole passage and such, but the point is that there's a piece of practical wisdom that is passed on within the family that is not directly the commandment of God, uh, but it's a how-to. Uh, this is the commandment, so how do we obey this commandment? And I think that can be really valuable. On the other hand, there is also the fact that the how-tos can become an obstacle. So the how to obey the, the Word of God can become an obstacle, because it did become an obstacle to the Pharisees. Uh, an oral tradition was developed during the exile to Babylon, uh, where the Jewish people, uh, they repented and they said, look, we have to obey these commandments because well, look at this, <laughs> you know, look at what's happened because we've been disobedient. And so they started to develop uh, a lot of little extra rules. How, how do we keep the commandments? Well, you know, and, and, and they started to put together some wisdom about Okay, well, how, how do we, how should we understand the commandments? How should we keep the commandments? And so on and so forth. The problem with that is that you have to keep separate what God is commanding you to do and your own kind of practical how-tos. And, and these, these, this practical wisdom is oral tradition, right? You know, we, we talk to one another about how we walk these things out. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that in and of itself. I think it can be valuable, but I think it's important to keep sorted out. The difference between what God actually told you to do and someone's advice that may or may not be for you. Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, uh, let me just flip on over there. Okay, I'm just going to read this whole chunk. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Uh, and then Jesus goes into examples here, and then he comes to the heart of the matter in verse 8 and 9. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their, their teachings are merely human rules. So it's important not to let human rules get in the way of the commandment of God. So should you pray together when you're dating? Should Christian singles pray together when they're dating? Uh, number one thing to check is heart condition. Uh, look, if, you're not, if your heart's not in the right place with God, it doesn't matter what rules you make. It doesn't matter what guidelines you make. You're going to find a way to disobey because you're disobedient in your heart. Jesus would command you to clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside can be clean also. That is the single most important thing. Is your heart in the right place? Now, even if your heart's in the right place, your brain and your body can be in the wrong place. You can put yourself in temptation that there's no way you could possibly overcome. You know, uh, one of my 
pastors and spiritual mentors in the past told me that there is a point at which God himself could walk in the room and you would say, God, could you wait outside for a minute? <laughs> because you put yourself in so much temptation. You know, being alone together, being in situations uh, where there's no way you can possibly overcome it. You should not expect to overcome it. This is why the Bible says flee fornication. So that's a thing. That's a thing. Um, so what is your heart condition? Super, super important that your heart is in the right place. And that is where uh, two believing people whose hearts are in the right place, from there you start to sort out where do the boundaries need to be. Uh, don't be foolish about it. Don't be foolish about your sin nature. Um, but figure out where the boundaries need to be. Uh, figure out what works for you to stay obedient. Uh, take the advice and take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the danger in telling Christian couples not to pray together is that it can become something where, uh, again, you know, a piece of uh, a healthy caution can be telling you to not practice the fundamentals of what the Bible teaches. Uh, Christians pray a lot. They pray all the time. They pray long prayers. They pray short prayers. Any person that you spend a significant amount of time with who is also a believer, you should end up praying with them. It is what it is. If you have a heart after God, that's what I expect to see. Um, Christians read the Bible a lot. Christians have long Bible readings and short Bible readings, and sometimes Christians quote the Bible to one another. Um, anybody you spend a significant amount of time with who's a believer, you're going to end up opening the word with. So, um, yeah, there's, there's no shortcuts. You're going to have to do the work. You're going to have to talk to God. You're going to have to be led by the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have to sort out where those lines are. And you're going to have to sort out, am I telling a story about this relationship that is the wrong story to tell? Am, am I getting carried away with some fantasy that, that I don't know whether this lines up with God's plan at all? Uh, you have to do the work. That's the work. And, and so that's my thoughts on this whole thing. Thank you for listening. Peace out.